Hello. I'm so excited to begin this journey with you. Isaiah is one of the greatest books in the Bible. It's often called the Prince of the Prophets, partly because possibly Isaiah was part of the royal family, but also because it's some of the greatest lyric Hebrew poetry in the whole Bible. But most of all, it's because this book, this book of Isaiah, contains more of the theology of the Bible than any other single book. Now, that's a pretty amazing statement, but I'll stand by it. There's more of grace and mercy in this book than any other. There's more of judgment and righteousness in this book than any other. And it's the combination of the two, justice and righteousness, mercy and grace, put together in such a remarkable, remarkable way. It's the greatest single picture of Yahweh's holiness and his sovereignty. It's the greatest single picture of creation to the new heaven and earth from beginning to end. But because of its complexity, it's a very difficult book. Many people speak to me and say, I just can't understand Isaiah. I love it. There's so many good parts of it, but I just can't understand it. One of my goals in this journey with you is that you will have an understanding of the book as a whole, as it works together. Many people compare Isaiah to a symphony, and that's a good comparison. Because in a symphony, you've got some key themes that go all the way through. And the better the composer is, the more those themes are interwoven and worked out together. And that's just what Isaiah says. One of the great themes in the book is hope through judgment. The people in Isaiah's day are facing great threats, particularly from the Assyrian Empire to the north, the area called Kurdistan today in the northern part of Iraq. And they are wondering, is there hope for us, Isaiah? Is there hope that somehow we're going to be delivered? And Isaiah says, oh yes, there's hope. But I have to tell you, for this generation, the only hope is through judgment. Well, obviously, they didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear that the way to hope was through judgment. But that's exactly what the book tells us in its overall structure and in its microstructure. But there's another theme that I want to suggest. That's one theme, hope through judgment. Here's the second one, servanthood. In the Chapters 40 through 55, the words servant and servants appear over and over and over again. Now, they're not so frequent in 1 to 39 or 56 to 66, the three great segments of the book. But I think we should read servanthood right through the book. You say, now, wait a minute, if, it, if it's really not that prominent in 1 to 39, why would you say that? Think about the New Testament. How prominent is the Messiah as a specific concept in the Old Testament? Well, not that prominent. But the New Testament tells us how to read the Old Testament, that we are to read it as Jesus taught his disciples on the Emmaus Road. We're to read it in the light of what God has done in Christ. I think the same thing is true here in Isaiah, that that very prominent segment, 40 to 55, and to a certain extent, 56 to 66 as well, with their emphasis upon servanthood, tells us, oh, if we're to understand 1 to 39 correctly, we've got to see them in the light of servanthood as well. And with that in mind, I want to offer to you this overall outline. First of all, in chapters 1 through 6, we have servanthood, the problem, and the solution. 
And we'll see how that works in some succeeding lessons. Then in 7 to 39, chapters 7 to chapters 39, the overarching theme running through those chapters is trust. Will you trust Yahweh? Will you give your lives to him believing that you can trust him? So I want to call those chapters, Trust, the Basis of Servanthood. But the question is, yeah, we know we can trust him, and we do know that by chapters 36 to 39, but what will really motivate us to trust him? Because they knew it, but they didn't want to do it. The answer comes in chapters 40 to 55. Grace. Grace is the motive for servanthood. If we know that God has loved us in spite of our sin, if we know that he has loved us in spite of our shame, hey, I think I could serve a God like that. But what about these people? These people that Isaiah is writing to in those chapters, 40 to 55, they're in exile in Babylon because of their sins. How can they be God's servants? And the answer is grace, the means of servanthood. And in chapters 49 through 55, we see the revelation of the ideal servant who will be for Israel what Israel could never be for itself. So it's over. <laughs> Chapter 55, you have this beautiful, beautiful benediction. The hills are going to dance. The trees are going to clap their hands. Everything's going to be wonderful. Ah, let's have the benediction go home. Oh, no. <laughs> We've got 11 chapters yet to go, 56 to 66. And what are they about? They're about the character of servanthood, righteousness. The servant who is called to declare God's name and nature to the nations had better demonstrate that name and nature in his or her own life. And that's what chapters 56 to 66 are about. Now, before I let you go, let's talk just a few minutes about the historical setting of this book. It's an unusual book because chapters 40 to 66 are written to people far in the future from Isaiah's own lifetime. That's unusual. Other prophets talk about people in the future. This is the only one that talks to people in the future. And we'll say a little bit more about that as we go along. But chapters 1 to 39 were written during Isaiah's lifetime from about 740 till sometime after 700, a time when, as I said, the Assyrian Empire is beginning to threaten a time when the northern kingdom of Israel falls and the border of the Assyrian Empire is six miles north of Jerusalem. Wow, a frightening time. In those years, though, Isaiah has this incredible vision of Yahweh, Yahweh who is the king of all the nations, Yahweh who holds the Assyrians in his hands. But wait. The day is going to come when the Assyrians are gone and the Babylonians have come. What about that great vision of God then? And I believe that Isaiah is inspired to write chapters 40 to 55 in those years out in the future. He's writing them to those years out in the future to say, yes, this vision of Yahweh, it's still going to apply there in the future. And then chapters 56 to 66 possibly are addressing people who have returned from exile and now seem to think, oh, <laughs> we've got it all knocked. We've got it in hand. It doesn't matter how we live. And Isaiah knows that it will matter. And he's writing to them and he's saying, yes, this great vision of Yahweh that I've had, it applies to you too. And it applies in these ways. So that's the book. That's the book we're going to be looking at on this wonderful, wonderful journey.